This presentation is brought to you by the SDG Decision Education Center. I'm Lynn Slattery. I'm the director at Texas Executive Education, where I manage a portfolio of open enrollment programs for designed for busy professionals. This portfolio includes the Strategic Decision and Risk Management Certificate Program, which brings together the academic research and practical application teaching of UT faculty and the 35 years of experience in strategy consulting and decision education of SDG, and serves as the basis for this webinar series. We are proud to be partnering with SDG on this series of webinars. Today I'm excited to have two experts in the field of biases and how they affect our decisions. Dr. Art Markman and Carl Spetzer ready to share their knowledge. Art is a professor of, of psychology and marketing, as well as the founding director of the program in the Human Dimensions of Organizations at the University of Texas at Austin. Art's passion for bringing insights from cognitive science to a broader audience has him writing blogs for Psychology Today and Fast Company and co-hosting a radio show and podcast called Two Guys on Your Head. Carl is the CEO of Strategic Decisions Group. For 40 years, he has helped top business leaders create innovative strategies and deal with the complexities of risks over long time horizons. And with that, Art, I will turn it over to you to begin. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Lynn and Carl and everyone for being here today. What we want to do is to talk a little bit about, about the biases that we have that influence the way we interpret the world. And from the very beginning, I actually want to highlight a bias in the word bias. Because really what we're talking about is the variety of ways that the human cognitive system makes guesses about what's happening in the world so that we can interpret what's going on around us quickly and reasonably accurately. You know, one of the reasons why most of us don't recognize the, the number of biases that we have is that most of us are actually quite successful at getting around the world really well almost all the time. What we don't recognize is that the reason we're able to do this so effectively is because we actually make systematic guesses about what's going on around us and that those guesses often turn out to be right. And so what we want to do is to give you, is to start by giving you a few demonstrations of some of the factors that affect these biases and then we'll talk about how that can actually cause problems in large scale kinds of decisions and then, and then really uh, figure out what we can do to help uh, deal with that more effectively. So to get ourselves started, I want to ask a really simple question about a guy you've never met named Donald. So you meet Donald for the first time, say, at a party, and you realize that he's very quiet, he's got a retiring personality, and you immediately want to make some kind of assessment about what sort of person Donald is. So here's a little poll. We want to know, um, do you think he's more likely to be a librarian or a salesman? So that's, that's your question, and there's, there's a little poll, so, so please feel free to, 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 to vote on this. And, and the idea here is we want you to tell us what you're thinking, right? It's, and, and, and I know we use the word bias, so you're already looking for the trick. But deep down, I want you to think about what do you think is happening. And if you, if you look at, uh, at the responses here, what we find is that, uh, that most of you, about 80%, which is typical for studies like this, say that you think that Donald is a librarian, and only 20% of you think he's a salesman. Now, there's no trick here. We, we, you know, died, all we did was, I, there is no right answer. Donald is, is you know, whatever he is. What's important to recognize is that immediately you had a sense from your knowledge about the world that, that uh, being shy and retiring is, is more representative, more typical, of librarians than it is of salespeople, that most salespeople we know are garrulous, they like to talk, they're extroverted, and that, that librarians tend uh, to be less so. And so what's, what's interesting about this is that this, this bias that you have affects you immediately, automatically, and you know the fact is, is probably often correct. Most of the people that you meet who are really uh, shy and quiet they frankly tend not, not to be salespeople, or at least not salespeople for very long. <laughs> okay, so that's one example. Let's try another one. Let's 
Oh, I'm sorry. Can I click on this. There we go. Excellent. So now this one is is a little bit uh, a little bit uh, more straightforward. Um, imagine that you bought a, a, a you, you bought a wiffle bat and a wiffle ball, and together they cost a dollar ten, and the bat costs a dollar more than the ball. And now the question, just really quickly, how much does the ball cost? Now, the and so we have a little poll for you here. And and the the fundamental question that we want to ask, you know, that we, that we want to demonstrate here is is that um, there are lots of questions that have real answers to them, and yet what's fascinating is that that with those real answers we still uh, have a sense of of what the answer might be. So let's let's give you a, a, the, the results of the poll here. Uh, we asked you does the, the question does the ball cost ten cents? And about 33% of you said yes, and 67% and said no, which is great. Uh, if, you, if you actually do the algebra on this, then for the bat to cost a dollar more than the ball, actually the ball has to cost five cents, and the bat has to, uh, has to cost a dollar five, right? Then that's why you get a dollar in between them. What's interesting, and this is an example of what Danny Kahneman called a cognitive illusion, the interesting thing about these cognitive illusions is that that um, when you hear a dollar ten and a dollar more, you have this natural reaction to just subtract the dollar from the dollar ten and say that the that the bat costs ten cents. Of course, if the bat actually cost ten cents and the entire thing was a dollar ten, then the bat would only have cost ninety cents more. But what's important is even those of you who got the answer correct still probably felt the pull of the answer 10 cents, right? There's, there's just something in the cognitive system that recognizes numbers in ways that, that often lead us astray. And it's important when we get to thinking about decision quality to recognize that we are surrounded by numbers when we make these kinds of decisions. But the fact is, numbers are a, a relatively late human invention. Math, complex math is a relatively late human invention. And and we don't necessarily deal with that as naturally as we could, which is why we are systematically drawn to answers that aren't correct, which is why even that 67% of you that correctly said that the ball doesn't cost 10 cents um, still understood why that was a, an answer that had some appeal to it. All right, let's try one more before we, we really start to, uh, to dig into the details of, of what we can do about this. So here's a question. Um, uh, we have, and again, this is one that doesn't have a, a correct answer. So imagine that there's a football game going on or a basketball game, and you uh, and, and there are two ticket holders to the game, and we want to know who is likely to hop in their car during the blizzard. Who's more likely to hop in their car during the blizzard to get to the game? So we have John and David, and they each plan to travel 40 miles to get to the game. Now John paid for his ticket, and if you've, if you've ever bought a ticket to a sporting event recently, you know he paid dearly for that. And David was on his way to purchase the ticket when he lucked into a free ticket, so he didn't pay anything for it. The blizzard is announced for the night of the game. Which, who's it going to be? Is John more likely to go, John who paid for his ticket, or David who did not? Who's more likely to hop in the car? So remember, John is the one who, uh, who paid for his ticket. David didn't. And uh, we're getting a bunch of votes here, which is great. Excellent. Um, so this is an interesting one. Uh, people overwhelmingly have the intuition that John, who paid for his ticket, is more likely to, to go to the game than David, who didn't. Now, economists call things like uh, the, the amount of money that you spent on some option or the amount of time that you spent, they call those sunk costs. And they're called sunk costs because you can't get them back. That money is gone. The effort that you spent, it's gone. And yet, pretty consistently in life, those sunk costs continue to influence the decisions that we make about the future. So John, the money that John spent to, to buy the ticket, it's gone. Right? He can't get it back. Uh, David got the free ticket, so, so he doesn't have that, that same pressure. Um, the interesting thing is that while we, we assume that John should be more likely to go, economists would say, actually, John should, should weigh the, the costs and benefits of traveling through the blizzard and not focus on how much he spent before. 
And yet systematically in small decisions like this, as well as much larger scale decisions, we continue to pay attention to these sunk costs in ways that can get us into trouble in the long run. So let me just put a framework around this, uh, just so that you can see where this is going. So what we've done so far is to just give you three examples of situations in which very quickly you make a set of assumptions about the way the world works and use those assumptions to interpret a new situation. Sometimes, for example, with Donald in ways that don't really affect the, the truth of the outcome. Sometimes in, in, in the case of sunk costs and more particularly in the case of the bat and the ball, uh, you, you may make a decision that's actually incorrect on the basis of the way that you focus on things going on in the world. Now, if you were to go to the magic of Wikipedia, and we've, we've cleverly grabbed a graphic from there, you will see that, that psychologists and behavioral economists have uncovered literally hundreds of these biases that influence decisions. And some of these biases, while they may help us most of the time to get through the world effectively, they're helping us to get through a world that is small, uh, built, built around a relatively small number of people and relatively small expenditures. But these same biases that are so useful some of the time can become real decision traps when it comes time to making large-scale decisions. And if we were to you know, zoom in on some of these, you see that not only are there hundreds, but, but they're, they're described with lots of different terminology. And if you tried to wrap your head around all of these biases, it would probably drive you crazy. Now, you could spend a career just doing that, but if your goal is not to just memorize the 190 uh, biases that are in, in this graphic, but also to understand what to do about them, it would be useful to have a framework to put around them, and that's really what we've done. So what we've done is to take these, this large number of biases and really distill it down into six classes of biases that people have. Uh, and so one of the things that we teach in our larger scale seminars is, is the nature of these kinds of biases, that we have biases, for example, to, uh, to think relatively rather than absolutely. So, so we, don't, we don't perceive the, the, the absolute magnitude of something. You know, is $100 good or bad? Well, it sort of depends. We, is it $100 is really good compared to $10? Not so good compared to a million. Um, we, have, we have habits that, that derive often from our personality characteristics that influence our behaviors. So just like Donald was shy and retiring, and that creates habits in him that might not be so beneficial for being a salesperson, each of us has personality characteristics that make us better or worse at different kinds of decisions. And of course, we have biases in reasoning that lead us to deal with complex situations in ways that aren't always a benefit and to deal with uncertainty in a variety of different ways. So with that, having laid out this framework for you, I'm going to turn it over to Carl to talk a little bit more about how this applies in the context of decision quality. And uh, I will talk a little bit about how these impact uh, us every day. Some of these biases uh, appear in clusters, and one of my favorite ones that we call a mega bias is the illusion of decision quality. And the illusion of decision quality affects everybody, but in particular, it's important when it affects decision makers. So when you tell a decision maker that uh, they're not already making the best decisions that they can, that's usually a surprise, especially if they're high up in the organization because that confirms that they've been selected because of their decision-making capabilities. But if we're a decision professional and we tell them, well, yes, we're telling you that you're not already making the best decisions you can, and if you're like most of us, you believe that you're making them when you're far from the best decision. And uh, obviously, they don't believe that at first and say, can you prove that? Well, here's what we go through to show them that this is the case. We take a, a group and mo many of the decisions that are significant in organizations are made in small teams and groups around the table. And you ask that kind of group, 
So how do you feel about the decision you made on a scale of one to 100%? Invariably, the answers come out 70, 80, 90, especially uh, if they've just made a decision. You have to feel good about the decision you made or you wouldn't have made it, okay? But then when you go and explain decision quality, and decision quality requires having an appropriate frame, having clear alternatives, uh, having the information necessary to be distinguishing among the alternatives, understanding what you truly want in terms of values, uh, being able to get to the right answer and reasoning your way through it in light of the future and uncertainties, which uh, introduces complexity of probability. And then ultimately a decision is nothing unless it has true commitment to action. And once you explain these uh, six requirements of decision quality and say, how are we doing on each one of them and rate each, invariably we get one that's pretty low, 20, 30% or something. In this case, uh, it's alternatives. Well, one characteristic of decision quality is that it's the weakest of these requirements that's the gate to decision quality. So decision quality get, doesn't get any better than the weakest link. And so we end up with what we call the illusion of decision quality, which in this case is a very big gap between what the true quality of the decision was that people have just landed on and what they thought they had done in terms of making a decision. So this is quite universal and it has a deep impact on individuals and organizations. And let me just uh, bring this to you by asking, uh, by uh, first of all, the conversation with an enlightened decision maker and then we'll ask you a question. So the decision maker, when they get it, say, you're telling me that this is true, so my sense of making good decisions is an illusion? I make good enough decisions and I believe they're the best decisions that I can make. And then I'm wired to rationalize. That's one of our biases on that big list. When we look back with hindsight, that makes it pretty hard to learn, doesn't it? And that is the dilemma in most organizations and in most individuals. We think we're already there. We, that's the illusion. And we don't have much uh, ambition because we think we're already there and we don't have a system that allows us to learn effectively because we don't even uh, record the quality of a decision at the time we make it. We mostly have an accounting system that looks at only the outcomes and traces what happens, but a decision can have good and bad outcomes and with hindsight, unless you actually have recorded the decision and thought about it at the time, you can't look back. So learning is a very hard thing to do, and that provides a dilemma. So let me ask you a question, and that is uh, how much you agree with this statement. In our organization, we're quite conscious of the decision quality illusion and have developed organization-wide decision competence. And you can either strongly agree, somewhat disagree, neither agree nor disagree, or somewhat agree or strongly agree. And please uh, put your answers in now. And uh, this, to me, the, when you believe you're already making good decisions, then making the change to organizational decision quality is a hard task. And we see that uh, we have more than half of our group saying they strongly disagree with having that currently. So there's a lot of room of uh, improvement. And we have 1%, so we must have some people in organizations that have already deeply adopted uh, organizational decision quality, which uh, there are some leading organizations that have gotten there. And so, <clears throat> Uh, now, what can we do about it? Well, in terms of getting something to do about it, we have to start with understanding the mind. And as Art outlined, we have really uh, many built-in mechanisms. Uh, Danny Kahneman, who got the Nobel Prize, 
uh, in this uh, has defined what he called system one, which is automatic and fast, and system two, which is deliberative and slow. This automatic and fast brain is so fast that everything goes through it before we even become are conscious and thoughtful about something. It's instinctive, it's fast, it's emotional, it's, it's hot uh, in a sense. It, it, we're not aware of it operating, uh, so it's in the subconscious or in, in the unaware section of our brain. And it uses lots of these characteristics of stereotypes. It's based on our mental habits and uses a lot of shortcuts. And it assumes that whatever it can reach for is sufficient to make our judgment. What uh, is called wisiyadi, what you see is all there is. The brain assumes what you see is all there is and, and all that's needed. Well, the deliberative brain is slower, and so you have to have a mental habit that says, I want to deliberately think about it, stop to think in this. In fact, it's one of the key things you have to teach kids. And the, uh, so that deliberative system is analytical, slow, rational, uh, cold, it's conscious, it takes effort. In fact, uh, when people use it a lot, they want to eat more, and if you want to have a good group uh, meeting where people apply, uh, apply their thinking, give them good food uh, along with it. It's reflective. It also can handle abstract thinking. And so those two are the key where we have to make changes. We add a third one, which is what we call a mental process for reaching to tools that is really augmenting our internal systems. You would never ex expect an engineer to build a bridge by deliberately sitting there and thinking only, okay? They have to use some spreadsheets and tools and, and uh, we can do a lot of things to engage external help. And when people say, what can we do about it? Well, we have a course where we will take a careful look at this human nature, where we first go through the, the distortions of judgment and decisions, and then we talk about developing repairs and preventions for reaching decision quality. And they come in these three forms. We have to develop new habits in our fast automatic mind. Just because it's an automatic doesn't mean you can't learn. It's just like you learn a uh, 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 some kind of a sport or learning to drive, most of the time we're on automatic and we can change our automatic responses. Uh, we can improve our mind wear, as we've been called, and improve our awareness, and that becomes a part of our deliberative thinking. And then we can develop tools and reach for tools and data. In fact, a lot of our preventions on strategic decision making are in category three and our explicit decision processes and role definitions and tools and data sets and experts uh, uh, reaching out to experts. So there's a lot here that can be done to improve things. And with that, let me turn it back to Art. And Art, could you tell us a little bit about the perspective and where it comes from? Sure. Thanks, Carl. So I think ultimately what we, you know, the idea here is that it's great to have tools, but if you don't understand how those tools fit in with the natural ways that you think, then there's a tendency not even to want to use those tools in the first place. Uh, so, and particularly when it comes to thinking tools, because one of the things that I've found over the course of my career is that almost everybody I know has a mind, but almost nobody knows how that mind works. And if you want to help people to improve the way that they're thinking, it's actually really critical to begin by helping them to understand the way that thinking works to begin with. And so really fundamentally what we're doing is taking basic research in behavioral decision science, understanding how the psychology of this works, understanding how the brain works, uh, and, uh, and then combining that with decades worth of work on more prescriptive techniques uh, that come from the uh, work on what are the ideal decisions that people make and putting those together
together in order to try to understand both how people make the decisions that they make on a daily basis, as well as how they ought to make those decisions if they want to do things more effectively than they've been doing them, and to really bring that together to create a set of tools that mesh with the way that people naturally want to make decisions, but also incorporate as much as possible tools that are going to help people to make those decisions more effectively. And so, in, you know, for example, in the class that we do on biases, what we're doing is saying, look, you need to know a lot about the way that you make decisions in order to use these tools effectively. Here's how the brain works. Here's how people make decisions effectively. And let's merge these in as effective a way as possible. And so we are drawing from both that basic research as well as the real applied work on tools to craft the best possible framework that can be, that is both effective and usable. All right, we are close with our time and I will throw out a question to Art um, on one of the things that has come in as we're, as we're watching, um, watching all of you ask questions and things. We had a question that was on, if these biases basically are getting us in so much trouble, um, why do we have them in the first place? Are they at all useful? Art, can you take that one? Sure, I'd be happy to. And it's such a great question because, you know, when, when we use the word bias, we, we naturally begin to think, well, okay, so, so why would we have biases that are leading us astray? Part of what we have to remember is that our thinking skills develop in, for environments that are very different from the modern world. We develop for environments that have you know, 100 to 125 people in them total, that's your entire society, you know everybody reasonably well, and you encounter directly almost all of the things in your world. What's interesting now is, of course, we have a social network that numbers now in thousands, uh, each as individuals. We, uh, we get our information across hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Uh, we have people who are paying for access to our brains through advertisements and through, uh, and through promotions of various kinds. And all of these aspects, which are very different from that evolutionary environment that we grew up in, affect the nature of the decisions that we make. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is really to update our thinking our, our thinking abilities for a world that's vastly different from the one that we developed for. Now, the interesting thing is our day-to-day -day life often really does involve fairly small numbers of people and, and smaller uh, types of decisions. And so where these biases have the biggest impact on our lives is in these situations in which we are making very large-scale strategic decisions for, uh, for companies that may affect the lives of hundreds or thousands of people, may, may, may require the expenditure of millions of dollars. That just, that falls outside of what we evolved to do, and that's really where these tools become so important. But again, important if they are designed in a way that fits well with our underlying psychology. Awesome. So I want to thank Carl and Art for spending their time with us today, and I also want to thank all of our participants for spending your time and energy with us today. We've enjoyed being with you and hope to see you again soon. 